In the spring of 1945, the war that we had provoked with such ambition was closing on us like a trap. In January of that year, I was the driver of a Tiger I Panzer in our defence of the River Oder. In February, my battalion was smashed apart and my commander, Hellman, was burned to death in his turret. By April, in the intense reorganisations required by our collapse, I was made commander of my own panzer with the 21st Panzer Division, part of the great German 9th Army. My panzer was one of the superb panthers, the pride of the panzer troops. My rank was now Feldwebel, sergeant, and I commanded a crew of teenagers who looked up to me as if I was a veteran at the age of 20. Our units tried to hold the Red Advance back from Berlin. This was impossible, and we were scattered, while the Reds stormed onward to the capital. In the last week of April, the trap was shut. The Red forces encircled our entire Ninth Army, south of Berlin, and shut us into a zone of forests where we could only conceal our vehicles and wait for orders. The hiding was a torment. We sat in our panzers and sweated, inside the Russian encirclement, inside a pine forest, inside a 48-ton panther. That was when I realised how completely caught I was, crouched on the commander's chair in the turret, sweat pouring down my back and my heart thumping like a jackhammer. The shadows of Russian bombers were flickering through the pine branches overhead, and the sound of the Russian artillery was loud even through the panther's armour plate. We were trapped locked in by the Russians, who would ship us to Siberia for sure if they captured us. Our only hope was to reach the American lines on the River Elbe to the west, for the Americans were our great hope now. They were once our enemy, the destroyers of our cities, but they were now our salvation if we could only reach them. To be a prisoner of the armies meant hot dogs, cabbage and the Geneva Convention. To be a prisoner of the Reds, we were sure meant slavery, the Arctic Circle, and never seeing your homeland again. But there was an entire Russian army between our battle group and the Americans, between our handful of panthers, our exhausted panzer grenadiers, and a following of civilian refugees who traipsed behind us, sobbing like a funeral procession. How long do we have to wait, Herr Feldwebel? my gunner asked me. The capo will be back soon, I told him. The Capo will know what to do. The Capo was our name for our platoon leader, our lieutenant. His original unit of six Panthers was now down to three surviving vehicles, and he was attending an emergency officer's briefing to decide our group's next move. The air in the Panther turret was foul, monoxide exhaust, shell explosive, oil and five big hunched young men who hadn't washed for weeks, sweating in the heat. I opened my commander's cupola. Light flooded in through the hatch. Clear, spring light scented with pine needles. Through a gap in the trees, I could see white clouds way up in the blue sky. In a second, though, the sky was crossed with vapour trails and the red-starred wings of the Russian planes, and the reek of explosive blew in on the warm breeze. The sheer hopelessness of our situation came home to me then. Our three panthers were parked among the pine trunks in a dense area of forest. To our east we had a thin screen of troops as a rear guard, but the Russians were probing and testing that line, minute by minute. The sound of their tank engines rose and fell on the breeze, and we could hear the exchanges of fire between our boys and the Russian infantry who rode on the red panzers. We knew from experience that the Russian commanders didn't like entering forests, whether from tactical reasons or some Slavic superstition, and their huge Joseph Stalin panzers, machines as big as Tiger I panzers, could not manoeuvre or traverse their gun barrels between the trees unless they knew the pathways that we knew. To the northwest and the southeast, two Russian army groups had closed on our location in a pincer of armour and mechanised infantry, crushing the few villages outside the woodland. Haydn had been shelled and burned to the ground, its inhabitants dying in the cellars. At Munchehuf, the few remaining civilian women had been raped for hours in the village square. Our reconnaissance men had watched this from the forest, their hearts torn between taking snipers' shots at the rapists and keeping their location hidden.
Schlepsig, a village of dairies and water mills, was blown to pieces by incendiary Katyusha rocket fire, the ditch where its last families took refuge becoming their tomb. Now a solid ring of Russian forces stood around us. Here in the forest, where we were hiding like wounded animals, our three Panther Panzers and several King Tiger Panzers of the Waffen-SS Panzer Corps were isolated with a group of some 5,000 men. Wehrmacht Volksgrenadiers, Waffen-SS elite troops, a company of Fallschirmjager, paratroopers, and huge numbers of the inevitable stragglers. More Wehrmacht men, Panzer troops who had lost their vehicles, rear echelon orderlies, Luftwaffe mechanics, artillery men with no guns, and a dozen other types and classes. Among them, in huddles and bunches throughout the trees, were groups of civilians. These were women, children and elderly men who had fled their homes in the farms and hamlets as the Reds advanced. With their possessions of a lifetime reduced to bundles, or piles of things in handcarts, they sat in the shadows, staring at the sky above the treetops, or walking up and down like caged creatures in their allotted spaces between the trees and the soldiers. Among them, I saw our capo returning from his briefing, his mottled camouflage uniform well suited to the dappled light, his face fixed in his permanent frown of concentration, his iron cross worn proudly at his throat. He walked past the knots of civilians without glancing at them. Only when an aircraft passed very low over the tree canopy, low enough to send pine cones down among us like toy hand grenades, only then did he look up at the sky. We all looked up. From the tops of the pine trees, small pieces of paper were emerging, floating down and twisting in the breeze. Most became stuck among the branches, but a few slipped between and span slowly down to the forest floor. I grabbed one as it fluttered across the turret and looked at it. It was a leaflet in neat printed German. Reich forces. Your position is surrounded by our armies, and the end of the war is imminent. Do not waste more lives. Any soldier bringing this leaflet to the Russian lines will be treated well, and all civilians will be given food and shelter. We all know that the war is almost over. Why fight on for no purpose? Save yourselves. After nightfall, your safety cannot be guaranteed. The leaflet was grabbed from my hand by the capo, who scanned it, crouching on the panther's engine deck, and then laughed. Ah, so we'll be treated well, he chuckled, slapping me on the back. What do you think, Faust? Shall we risk it? I mimed indecision, stroking my chin. It sounds a very generous offer, sir. I hear those hotels in Siberia are very spacious, he laughed grimly, as he gestured to the other tank crews to come over and join us, and there's as much snow as you can eat every day. I don't know, Herr Leutnant, I said. Russian snow doesn't agree with me. Nor me, Faust. The capo winked and put the leaflet in his pocket. I'll use this paper later by myself over a hole in the ground. Some of the civilians, though, had grabbed the leaflets and were studying them, debating the proposition in urgent voices. The capo turned his back on them and gathered the three of our panther crews, fifteen men in all, at the rear of our panther, where the big exhaust tubes stood at head height. Very well, the capo said, surveying his men. We're caught like rats in a sack here. The men nodded, knowing this was the truth. And there's one thing in that Verdam leaflet which is true, the capo went on. The war is coming to a close. We have to accept that fact if we haven't already. After the war, Germany will still exist, and Germany will need men like us to rebuild, to make it strong again, and to look after the people. Germany will need us as much in the next few years as it has in the past six years, I can tell you that. But for us to serve Germany in the future, we must surrender to the Americans. That is our task now. We panzer crews glanced at each other. The war coming to an end? Germany to be occupied and then rebuilt? These were massive ideas and difficult to accept, but the capo kept us focused on more immediate concerns. In this part of the forest, we are just one of many encircled groups of the Ninth Army. All these groups must move west and assemble in the Spree Forest. We will do so at first light. From the spree, we will put our panzer forces together 
and break out to the west in one coordinated movement, spearheaded by our heaviest available armour. At the same time, the Twelfth Army will fight their way up from the River Elbe to meet us, and they will form a corridor through which our forces can move to the west and the Americans. The crews reacted instinctively, giving the capo a series of tactical questions. Who would lead the final breakout from the Spree Forest? The King Tiger Panzers of the SS Panzer Corps. They would be the sledgehammer, breaking the path open through the red lines. Who would be the rear guard when we broke out of the Spree Forest? The remnants of the 32nd Panzer Division. They would hold off the Reds from the east while the escape corridor was opened. Supplies of ammunition. No more was available. Each panther had 30 rounds remaining, half its standard amount. Fuel. There was no fuel available. Gasoline would have to be found from abandoned vehicles or supplies on the route west. The men nodded grimly. We all noticed that the capo, usually so precise, had not produced a map or diagram of the planned route or the enemy positions. That meant he had no map. Well, so be it. Herr Leutnant, what of the civilians? The capo hesitated for a moment. Again, this was unlike him. The civilians? If they can keep up and follow us, let them, he said quietly. Otherwise, they will have to remain here. All of them? Yes, all of them. They must struggle on alone. We cannot evacuate them and we cannot help them. If we stay here, both the civilians and the troops are lost. If we break out, at least some troops will be saved for the future of our country. But Herr Leutnant, the women, one of the Panther commanders said, to leave them to the Reds, to be raped, killed, the capo took a long breath and fixed his eyes on the armour plate of the panther beside him. We cannot help them, he repeated. This is a national tragedy. We are seeking to seize some good from this disaster, from the events that have happened. This is our duty now. But Herr Leutnant, this is our duty. We will move at first light. In the spring dusk, the sound of fighting from the east was very clear. It was clear also to the civilians camped among us, the young mothers with children who sat pale and hunched over improvised stoves, while their kids scrabbled among the pine needles and earth. It was clear to the old men who stood staring at the stoves, sucking on pieces of stale bread from their haversacks. These civilians asked us no questions. They could tell by the way we were preparing the panzers, checking the engines over and sharing out the ammunition between the crews they could tell that we were moving out. Up to now, we had moved slowly where possible, enabling the civilians to walk after us with their carts and bundles. Now we would be charging, making a wild dash for the Spree Forest with the other battered remnants of the Ninth Army, with no time to wait for the non-combatants. To reconnoitre the immediate route ahead for this breakout at dawn, I went forward with the capo on foot. We left the encampment and walked with our MP40s in our hands through a series of paths between the trees, remembering the route from previous scouting forays. The pines thinned and we came within sight of the edge of the forest, where the trees gave way to a sandy plain dotted at intervals with craters, lakes and areas of marsh. That was the way to the Spree Forest and the west. It was an unpromising piece of terrain to advance across, open and soft, full of features which could bog a panzer down or leave it stranded to the red fire. The plane was strewn in places with wrecked vehicles, trucks, cars and Hanamag half-tracks, which had attempted to cross it two days previously, as the Russian pincers were closing on our forest hiding places. The capo and I went on foot further than we had been before, along the edge of the trees, where abandoned equipment, weapons and supplies showed where the final troops had tried to flee before the trap closed. There were many corpses along this way too. Many were Wehrmacht troops, hit by shell fire or by incendiaries that left the trees smouldering. The smell of ash, pine sap and human decay hung thick in the air here, untouched by the warm breeze. There were bodies too of civilians who had tried to dash across after the troops. One group of women had been pushing a handcart, and their shattered bodies lay among the pine cones, staring up at the branches. 
the quilts and bowls from their cart lay around them. After that, My God, said the capo, what has happened here? A small battle had taken place on the edge of the woodland, where a rough track led out into the plain. A section of German infantry was lying dead in the burned-out shell of their truck. Behind them, another group of women lay dead, but these women had been stripped, their naked bodies bearing witness to the violation they had endured in their final moments. Each had a bullet hole in her forehead, five bodies in all, five shots to the forehead. This is what awaits our civilians, the capo muttered, and yet we can't bring them with us. We ducked into the shadows as a pair of Soviet fighters raced over the tree line. The planes strafed the open plain for no evident reason, their cannon fire ripping through the abandoned vehicles there, setting some alight in spouts of flame. Then there was the echo of their departure and the constant noise of the fighting beyond the forest. The capo turned away from the women's bodies and pointed out across the plain. The SS King Tigers will go first he said. They will move at speed, close to the forest where the ground is firmer. We will follow them and hold off any reds that appear on the flanks of the plain. The infantry will move behind us on the edges of the trees. Then we will charge down the slope towards the village of Markov and go through it. The main Ninth Army is assembling five kilometres beyond there, in the spree forest beyond the plain. When we are with them, then the fighting will really start. I nodded, looking at the path along the edge of the trees. We would be moving like ducks on a fairground shooting stall, one after the other. Even now, there were surely Russian eyes in Markov, on the other side of the plain, or hidden among the trees in the forests on either side, watching our trees for signs of a breakout. The Russians had limitless ammunition, endless supplies of their panzers, infinite quantities of troops which they regarded as expendable. All that against our few King Tigers and three Panthers, and a ragtag army of hungry and disoriented infantry desperate to reach the Americans. So desperate that they would abandon their own civilians to the Reds. There was no other way. Dusk was gathering, and as we went back to the encampment, the horizon beyond the plain was illuminated by tall columns of flame, stretching to a great height under the stars. We guessed these were the remains of one of our transport columns that had been caught on the other side of the open ground. How many trucks, panzers and wagons would have to burn to create such a pillar of fire? Closer at hand, the sky was lit by flares as the Russians tried to illuminate the forest. One parachute flare drifted down on top of us, its white magnesium setting the pine branches alight and turning the whole area to daylight until we scrambled away from its glare back into our hiding place deep in the trees. Although no lights or fires were visible, it seemed that the whole forest was awake in the twilight and working like devils. We passed shadowy areas where we knew the Waffen SS King Tiger Panzers were concealed under piles of branches, and we heard sounds of these branches being thrown aside and the mighty engine's trial started. In other areas, our infantry was readying themselves for the first light, Nobody was sleeping. How could they, knowing what the morning would bring? Among them, the cries of civilian children and their mothers reminded us of the imminent fate of these compatriots as soon as the Reds moved into the forest. I put that out of my mind and went back to my panther. My crew were good soldiers. In the last daylight, they were cleaning out the panther's long gun barrel, using the six-metre-long rods to drag a wad of cloth down the barrel using a new wad each time until the cloth passed down the tube clean. This scoured the rifled bore clean of explosive residue, ensuring the gun would fire accurately and without warping. We also checked over the tracks, the lubrication points inside the turret, the hydraulics and the oil filters above the engine. Then we sat inside the panther, myself, my gunner and our loader on our perches in the turret, the radio man at his machine gun point in the hull, and the driver beside him at the controls. Were we sleeping, or were we awake and thinking of the morning's battle to come? I did both, moving between sleep and thought, as flashes and explosions lit up the glass of my cupola periscopes.
At first light, the civilians stood to watch us go, grey, spectral figures in their shawls and blankets, the children clinging to the women's knees. Some began to form up behind us as we started our engines. The panthers' exhausts sent up sparks into the air, lighting the civilians in flickering red and orange. I had my last sight of them from the cupola, a phalanx of these forms, stumbling and running after us as the panthers swayed between the trees towards the plain. Then the infantry came out to follow us. In a few seconds, huge groups of our infantry emerged behind us from every shadow and gap in the trees, swarming in the dust and fumes we threw out, knocking aside the few women who could still keep up, and finally blotting out the last of the civilians behind a solid wall of ragged grey and blue uniforms. In the dawn light, they were unshaven, haggard, their eyes filled with blank determination. The civilians, left in their wake, were on their own now. The dash to the spree forest was beginning. My panther turret was humid, filled with fumes and the roar of the Maybach engine through the crew compartment wall. We moved at walking pace between the trees, following an old forestry track lined with the hulks of abandoned vehicles, felled trees, wounded men unable to walk who looked hopelessly for help, and at every moment more and more of our infantry were emerging from the depths of the forest, ready to join the escape route to the west. As we neared the edge of the trees, close to where I had patrolled with the capo in the dusk, we came on a phenomenal sight. Two of our massive King Tiger Panzers were already in position to make the first bid to leave the forest. Almost one and a half times the weight of my panther, they towered over the narrow path, belching exhaust fumes, their mottled camouflage well adapted to the light and shade conditions. Their ultra-long 80T mippet of gun barrels projected to the west, away from the density of trees. With such a long barrel, the danger was that it would hit the trees as the vehicle manoeuvred. The commanders were visible in the turret cupolas, their faces blank, betraying no emotion at all. As they saw us, they waited barely a few seconds more, and then the tigers shook and moved towards the plain. The air behind them quivered with the heat of their exhaust, and their tracks threw out branches and clods of earth as the massive steel treads bit the earth. On the edge of the forest, a squad of engineers was at work cutting down a handful of remaining trees with axes, the final trees that screened the interior of the woods and prevented vehicles exiting or entering. One by one the trees toppled, and as the last one fell, the two tigers crushed it under their tracks as they advanced over the debris. Smashing aside the carcasses of burned-out trucks, the two tigers moved out to the edge of the plain. Behind them, another king tiger emerged from the depths between the trees, its sloping front plate and long, slim turret draped with foliage. It misjudged the narrow passage between the trees and had to ram down a series of huge pines to reach the perimeter, wasting time and petrol and risking a damaged track in the process of destroying the trunks. Finally, in a hurricane of fumes, sparks, crashing trees and roaring engines, the King Tigers were out on the plain and advancing along the tree line towards the west. The Russians responded immediately. As our panther manoeuvred up to the exit point, past the massed lines of infantry being held back by their officers, I put my forehead to the periscope and squinted along the tree line. I could see the last of the King Tigers ahead of us, blowing sparks in the grey light with its turret pointing left across the plain to the opposing side. In seconds, a flash of tracer struck it on the side of the turret, and a shell deflected off the angled side wall and spun off into the trees, still glowing brightly. The tiger rocked but kept moving, traversing its gun to aim at the possible origin of the shot. I ordered my gunner, who had control of the turret traverse through his foot pedals, to rotate our gun likewise. Through the aiming bracket on my cupola, I saw only a solid wall of shadowy trees with mist hanging between them, betraying no sign of enemy activity. Then the tracer came again and flashed across the plain towards the King Tiger. I saw the shell hit the tiger on the rear this time, near the tracks and the idler wheel at the back. This was a high explosive round, and it burst in a white star. I saw the entire rear wheel of the tiger, a metal disc that took three men to lift it, 
fly off and tumble away over the grassland. The tiger's track links fragmented and span out, and the whole 70-ton panzer slewed around out of control to one side, blocking the way ahead in a spray of earth and stones as it came to a halt, its track hanging out behind it, quivering with the beat of the panzer's engine. Those red gunners knew how to bring down a king tiger in stages, not with armour-piercing rounds, but firstly by blowing the running gear off, leaving it stranded. I saw the origin of the shot, though, and called it out to my gunner, as he had control of the panther's turret. In the trees, where the mist was dissipating, above a small lake of reeds. There. There was the outline of a T-34 tank, wreathed in the smoke of its gun. On my order, our driver slowed and halted to give us firing stability. My gunner grunted as the panther rocked and went still. Then he laid the shot with the hydraulic controls and fired. The tracer streaked out and the panther bucked gently as our muzzle brake and hydraulic dampers absorbed the gun's recoil. We moved again and approached the stranded King Tiger. Over in the trees, I saw that our shell had hit the T-34 because its frontal plate was emitting a dark smoke and it was beginning to advance out of the tree line to shorten the range against us. Ahead, the damaged Tiger was firing at the T-34, its hull rocking as it discharged the shot. It fired again and then again, and I realised that the crew were determined to fire all their ammunition before they relinquished the stricken vehicle. From the opposing tree line, I saw through my periscopes more T-34s emerging from the woods, knocking trees aside as they lumbered out to face us. For panzers, which were barely equal in armour and weaponry to the panther, let alone the King Tiger, they showed no hesitation in streaming out towards our panzers, slewing around the ridges and ponds in the plain. The King Tiger in front of us fired like the devil himself, sending round after round screaming onto the row of six T-34s that advanced on us. The Tiger's massive 88 metaba gun made short work of two of the red panzers immediately. One red was struck on the turret, smashing off a large scab of metal plate which shot away across the plain in a stream of sparks. The T-34 whirled around out of control and crashed nose down in a bed of reeds. I told my gunner not to fire on it, but to conserve ammunition, as it was already starting to burn. The Tiger hit the second T-34 directly through the glacis plate, and I saw large pieces of the hull fly off as the red machine exploded inside. My own gunner hit a third red tank as it raced towards us, hitting it in the gun mantle with a force that knocked the top surface of the red's turret completely away from the walls. The T-34 kept advancing on us, with its dead commander hanging out of the broken turret, his body on fire. We did not fire on it, but let it approach, slowly running out of momentum, until it stopped and erupted in an orange fireball. I checked all round in the periscopes to assess the situation now. The remaining three T-34s were retreating in reverse gear, keeping their thick front plates facing us, firing wildly with their undoubtedly ample supply of ammunition. The King Tiger was shooting at them, clearly determined to get a strike with its last rounds. It shot one of the retreating red tanks through the front track, which unwound and shed itself loose. That T-34 veered to one side, crashed down into a depression and tipped over, with its upper hull exposed and its working track still running freely. The Tiger fired one last shot and pierced the tank through the engine deck. The whole vehicle shook as the engine exploded, and even as the Red Crew men struggled to leap from the hatches, its fuel erupted in a furnace that lit the heath for a wide radius. I looked away as the burning crew men disappeared in the flames to see the King Tiger crew disembarking and gesturing to my panther for assistance. In the forests beside the King Tiger, massed ranks of our infantry were moving between the trees, rushing onward after the leading King Tigers, which were rolling ahead towards the west. Behind us, the Capo's Panther and our third Panther brought up the rear, as we had planned, shielding the infantry from further attacks. I allowed the stranded King Tiger crew to climb onto our Panther, and in moments they were clinging onto the back deck among the engine fumes. As we skirted around their abandoned vehicle, I saw it explode internally, the hatches blowing out and tumbling into the air.
The crew, professional to the last, had set a demolition charge to prevent the powerful machine from being captured by the Reds. After that, we were rolling ahead again, keeping on our right the forest with its moving mass of men and the plain on our left. About 600 metres ahead, the King Tigers were leading the way, their great turrets rising and falling as the hulls ploughed across the undulating ground. We had progressed about two kilometres and had three more kilometres to go until we reached the village. The light was increasing and the pines began to show their green hue as the day began to break. I wiped the sweat from my face. Could it be that we were going to succeed, to break through? The Red Forces seemed unresponsive, other than that brief counter-attack from the unit of T-34s, but I knew the Reds too well to assume that they were sleeping or distracted. At every moment, with every creak of the Panther's running gear, every growl of the Maybach engine, I expected more trouble. It came in the form of a massive bombardment, a hail of rockets which appeared from over the tree canopy to the west, trailing plumes of sparks and shot down onto our column in fractions of a second. Katyushas, I shouted. Keep us moving, driver, in the name of God. The rockets smashed into the ground along the tree line, bursting between my panzer and the King Tiger up ahead, and showering us with shrapnel which smacked off our armour plate with hollow impacts. I looked to the rear through the periscope and glimpsed the Tiger crew on our engine deck sheltering behind our turret. A Katyusha exploded behind us, and two of those crewmen were blown off our hull, falling into the path of the Capo's panther behind us. I saw that panther swerve, but I could not see if he avoided crushing the men. In the trees beside us, the rockets were exploding in whirlwinds of destruction, felling tall trunks and sending them flailing around. Underneath them, the massed lines of infantry were running like men possessed, leaping over the wounded and dying as they fought to get ahead, to get out of this fire zone. The rockets changed then from high explosive to incendiary, and they exploded among the trees in sheets of liquid flame which cascaded down onto the fleeing men below, covering the unlucky ones in a torrent of fire. Men ran on fire, jumped and rolled with their uniforms and rifles burning on their backs. Other men jumped over them, ducking between the pouring flames in their frantic search for a way through. Ahead I saw two king tigers outlined against the exploding flames, at a point where the forest wall fell away and the plain sloped downward towards the village of Markov, which we would have to traverse. I saw the huge vehicles slow, with dust shooting up from their tracks, and then come to a halt on the plain, away from the burning trees. Why had they stopped there, on the crest of the ridge itself, on the top of the slope where they could be readily seen? With the Katyushas still bursting around us, we approached the King Tigers, and then came level with them, our panther tipping over the crest of the ridge beside them, to face downwards. I could see immediately why even a King Tiger would halt when faced with that slope. The village of Markov itself was clearly visible, with flames rising from its outlying houses, its slender church spire pointing up through the smoke. The slope leading from us to the settlement rolled down at a gradual gradient for about two kilometres, the scrubland steaming with dew in the early warmth. This slope was absolutely alive with explosions. It was being bombarded with heavy artillery from the red sectors, with shells big enough to scoop up chunks of earth the size of automobiles and throw them high into the air, disintegrating as they fell. The slope was strewn with abandoned and burned out vehicles, the flotsam of our final elements who reached the west before the encirclement. As I watched, an abandoned eight-wheel armoured car was hit by a shell and thrown to the height of a house into the air, its tyres spinning off in all directions. For any vehicle to cross this zone of death was an invitation to destruction. The capo contacted me on the radio set, my wireless man connecting me through the headset. We will have to go ahead, he shouted. We cannot stop. See, the tigers are moving now. Yes, the two great king tigers were beginning their charge down the slope, their angled front plates set squarely in the direction of the village down there, with their long gun barrels pointing at the houses. If we can take the village and the road through it, the capo shouted, 
The infantry can get through. Follow the tigers. My God, our gunner said suddenly. My God, Herr Feldwebel, there are wounded down there. As we began to move onto the gradient, into the whirlwind of explosions, with shrapnel smashing into our armour plate, I saw that the gunner was correct. To one side of the slope, a series of trailers on rubber tyres were abandoned, some still hooked to trucks, others simply dumped in the open. These were metal box trailers of a type often used as ambulances, and from their open rear doors, I could distinctly see wounded men arranged on tiers inside, some gesturing to us weakly. There were five of these trailers, with perhaps fifty or sixty wounded men in total. We approached one of these, accelerating and unable to halt or give assistance to the wounded. Our only hope of getting through was to keep moving and minimise our time in the open. As we passed the first trailer, it was rocked by a high explosive shell which ripped the sides off and threw the wounded men still on their stretchers across the ground. There was no chance to swerve. Our panther rolled over them without even a bump, crushing their stricken bodies where they lay. Our driver groaned and cursed as this happened, but there was no way to avoid the massacre. The other trailers that we passed were filled with the terrified faces of wounded men huddling together as the shells exploded around them, knowing that death could strike at any moment. Then we were past these doomed men and went charging down the slope, rearing and bouncing between the shell bursts towards the village. In front of us, I saw the two king tigers moving like steamrollers down the incline, crushing flat the few vehicles that lay in their paths. One tiger completely crushed an empty staff car, and the gasoline left in it exploded in a puff of flames under the tiger's treads. The other tiger dipped down into a reed bed and came up streaming with mud and water, its momentum such that even the marshy ground could not hold it back. The tiger was hit by a shell which exploded on its flank, and its armoured track guards were blown away in a starburst of fire, but the panzer did not slow for a second. As we raced behind the king tigers, I checked around for our other two panthers. The capo, distinguished by his commander's extended radio aerial, was next to us, but our third panther was lagging behind, travelling more slowly. It had an engine problem, perhaps or had taken a shell strike on the running gear. It slowed yet further, falling behind, and I had to turn my attention to the front again. We were approaching the village, and now we could see Russian P-key, anti-tank guns emplaced in earth embankments around the meadows at the edge. A pack shell hit us on the front plate with a crash that jarred my teeth, and then another smashed into our turret close to my head, feeling like a blow to the temple. We rolled on, though, and I saw repeated piquet rounds deflecting off the colossal armour of the tigers in front, tracer rounds spiralling off the hull and turret as the panzers raced through the tornadoes of shrapnel. One king tiger was hit by high explosive, but the round burst against the turret and did not damage the tracks. All of our panzers were swaying, rising and falling now as we lurched over the uneven ground, and this wild movement made it harder, of course, for the red gunners to target any specific place on our structures. We were travelling at 30 kilometres per hour, bucking and swerving almost out of control, and in a few seconds, the enemy PAK emplacements loomed up directly in front of us. There was no time to slow down, and no need to do so. The King Tigers crashed into the emplacements first, smashing the earth walls aside in a cloud of debris. I saw an entire Red Pack crew turn and flee, but first their gun was chewed to pieces by the tiger's tracks, and then the men themselves were scythed down, first by machine gun fire from the panzer and the survivors by being trampled under the churning tracks themselves. I saw the tiger's track work run bright red with flesh, and then we ourselves were colliding with a Peke position and wreaking the same destruction. The entire barrel and wheels of a pack gun rose up in front of us as we broke open its emplacement, the gun revolving in the air as it was thrown to one side by the momentum of our tonnage. The red gunners too were smashed apart, with boots and helmets spinning around our turret as our driver slewed the machine to one side to hit another emplacement. This one caused us to rear up into the air, and I believe we were airborne for a short while, 
and then our entire weight came hurtling down on the gun underneath us. I heard and felt the red ammunition detonate under us, but by then we were beyond the emplacement and careening towards the houses of the village. I could see red troops running from us through the one main street and others firing on us with small arms or hurling grenades. I opted to use some precious ammunition and ordered my gunner to clear the settlement. Two rounds of our high explosive sent the remaining reds scrambling away and the firing against us ground to a halt. We came to rest with a mighty thump up against the earth wall of a farmer's animal enclosure, where many dead cattle lay with their legs stiffened upward. To our right, the two king tigers were firing intermittently into the village, and beside me, the capo's panther advanced into the main street, firing down it towards the square that we could see at the far end. I looked back at the slope behind us. Our third comrade panther was stranded on the incline, with black smoke drifting from its engine. It was shuddering and making jerking movements as it tried to advance, but the running gear was evidently seized. Behind it, a mass of German infantry was already surging, not in disciplined ranks, but in a mob of field grey, blue and camouflage uniforms, running each man for himself down the slope towards us, through the smoke of the bombardment still swirling in the air. The sun was rising behind them in the east, and this lit the smouldering trees of the pine forest in a lurid glow, showing up the folds of the ground and the debris the men were scrambling over. This frantic horde managed to cover a hundred metres or so before the Katyusha rockets came down on them again. In the time we had charged down the hill, the Soviet rocket gunners had clearly recalibrated their launchers onto the slope, and now the high explosive and incendiary warheads came screaming in again, directly into the mass of charging infantry. The stranded panther was hit first, even as the horde of infantry swarmed past it. With a colossal impact, the turret of the panzer was blown completely off the hull, flinging the panzer crew out into the charging mass of infantry, where they disappeared under the hundreds of boots. A second shell exploded among the running figures, and then another, until I turned my eyes away from the carnage and the whirling, fragmented bodies. In front of us, I could make out through the dusty periscope glass the pasture before the village, the shattered houses, and the rear plate of the capo's panther as he traversed his turret left and right in the middle of the main street, probing for resistance. I saw a group of red soldiers slip out of a doorway on his right, clutching small packages which could only be anti-panzer mines. My gunner saw them too, and fired a burst of MG from the coaxial gun. The reds sprawled on the cobbles, their bodies rolling over as the bullets propelled them across the stones. On my left, the two massive king tigers rumbled up into the edges of the village, standing against the picturesque timbered buildings in stark outline. They progressed slowly around the edge of the settlement, using an unsurfaced road that ran beside the village through its water meadows. Even as my panther began to enter the village, the German infantry was on our heels. Hundreds of our ragged, emaciated comrades began to pour off the slopes and run, walk or hobble after the King Tigers, while some, those best armed and seemingly most alert, cautiously came in behind us to the village centre, fanning out along the frontages and sweeping the gardens for concealed enemy troops. In the main square, as the Capo's panther and mine halted with our eyes on a row of Russian trucks that could be exploited for fuel, a handful of red prisoners were dragged together, men who had been hiding in cellars or gardens, disarmed and reluctant to fight. We set them to work immediately, once we had ascertained that the trucks used gasoline and not diesel. The prisoners were put to work, using our hand pumps to siphon off the precious fuel from their trucks and transfer it to the two surviving panthers. Several shells fell among the houses, blowing the roofs off and causing gable walls to collapse, but the bombardment seemed to be slackening in intensity, the Russian artillery perhaps not realising that their men were no longer in control of the village. In this comparative lull, many German civilians emerged and began to gather around the panthers, begging us to take them with us, away from the encircling reds. Our way forward is through the spree forest to the west, the capo said to them. That is a dangerous journey, and we cannot slow down for you. 
Come inside here and see something, one old man said to us. Come. While the red prisoners were still pumping the fuel, the old man took the capo and myself into the largest building on the square, an ancient council chamber surmounted by an ornate weather vane. It took time for my eyes to adjust to the dim light inside, which was filtered through coloured glass windows. In this old council hall, on the wood floorboards polished by generations of villagers' feet, there was a row of young women, naked on the floor. Their bodies glowed a waxy colour in the faint light, among the wounds and splashes of blood that covered their bodies. From a ceiling beam, two men were hanging from nooses, their necks broken, their open eyes staring down at the corpses of their daughters, the man explained. They were made to watch this, and then they were hanged. Back outside, the capo allowed the civilians to climb onto the panzers. Then he took his Walter pistol, and when the red soldiers had finished pumping the fuel, he took them to one side and shot them dead, in the back of the neck, one after the other against the council chamber wall. A circle of villagers, troops and US panzer crews watched this, and then we moved out of the settlement, towards the woodland beyond where we could see the King Tigers halted under the first trees of the Spree Forest, our objective. A throng of several hundred civilians followed our panthers on foot into the woods. We went past the King Tigers, and now it was we who led the way. The civilians proved helpful. One woman perched on my turret with a carbine slung over her shoulder, and pointed out to me the broadest tracks to take to enable us to reach the dense central part of the forest most quickly. As we moved out of sight of the village, I heard the scream of aero engines. A trio of red aircraft, the type known as the Sturmovik, was racing over the village, strafing with cannon. I saw the remaining red-tiled roofs of the houses fracture in sparks, until, as we rounded a corner in the track and moved finally away, the whole village was enveloped in a whirlwind of smoke and ash. The Russians had realised that we had broken through, but what happened to Markov was behind us now, and we had to forget it. We were where we aimed to be, in the Spree Forest itself, and now we had to move across it and break out to the west. Well, we are in the Kessel, the capo said to me on the radio from his panther. We are Kessel Panzers now. A Kessel, a cauldron, a boiling pot. A Kessel is a pocket of troops who are surrounded, but won't give up or surrender. A Kessel is a living, breathing stew of troops and civilians, of panzers, vehicles, horses and carts. We were part of the Kessel now, breakout from the Kessel. To say that we were not alone in the Kessel would be a terrible understatement. The Kessel consisted of the entire Spree Forest, east of a small town called Halbe, which was a place that I had never heard of before, but would never be able to forget. The spree contained ancient oak, pine and birch groves, which stretched perhaps 30 kilometres from east to west, punctuated by small lakes, heaths and firebreak channels where no trees grew. This whole area was alive with people. With tens of thousands of people we began to realise as we penetrated deeper into the woods, heading west. The forest tracks, Bare earth roads meant for forestry wagons, not an army, were full of people walking, limping, driving and riding to the west. Some were soldiers of all ranks, insignia and uniforms, including Wehrmacht, Waffen-SS and Volkssturm, civilian defence force, troops, all mingled together. The Volkssturm men were dressed in civilian clothes, with Panzerfausts, single-shot bazookas, and the crude submachine guns manufactured specifically for their use. Some of the troops were wounded, and they walked on crutches, or they travelled by climbing onto any vehicle that would accept them, whether a panzer, truck or horse cart. Men slept on the decks of panzers crawling slowly along the roads, or sat on the turrets, on the track covers, or the gun barrels themselves, their heads swaying as they slept upright. Many were civilians, elderly men, women of all ages and large numbers of children, all mixed with the troops, riding or begging for places alongside the soldiers. Some of the civilians were armed with shotguns, pistols or military carbines and walked almost like troops with only backpacks and their guns, 
Others were trying to move their possessions in handcarts or wagons pulled by horses or oxen. Some refugees had brought their animals with them, and it was not unusual for our panther crewmen to jump down and clear a path through a huddle of cows, pigs or goats being driven by an old farmer with a stick. Behind our two surviving panthers, the SS King Tigers gave lifts to SS men only, dozens of men on each panzer, their camouflage uniforms blending in well against the foliage and dappled light. On this narrow track, full of obstructions and abandoned vehicles, our progress was agonisingly slow, and we saw terrible sights as we passed through between the oak trees. Several times, Soviet aircraft flew over the tree canopy, firing randomly down at the forest floor, evidently not caring whether they hit anything or what it was that they shot up. One such strafing attack sent a volley of cannon tracer tearing diagonally through the branches, ripping off heavy boughs and setting them alight. One tree limb crashed down onto a family pushing a handcart, a mother, grandmother and children, killing the two women. Their bodies were left in the undergrowth, and the day's children took a few possessions from their cart and simply started walking again, with no protection at all, soon disappearing in the column of foot traffic. Katyusha rockets also exploded in the trees, the shrapnel raining down on us along with splinters of wood that tore into the people clinging to the vehicles. The civilian woman acting as my guide, who was standing on my rear deck, was hit in the arm by such a splinter, and I gave her a bandage from our field dressing pack. She bandaged herself with gritted teeth, her eyes full of tears. At one point in the afternoon, we halted to add oil to the engines and allow them to cool, as the crawling progress was overheating them dangerously. We steered our two panthers off the track and bulldozed aside several young trees to form a space away from the road without causing a break in the overhead foliage. As the panther's engine shut down, the metal clanged while it contracted, and the great Maybach unit hissed to itself in the shade. The King Tigers pulled up next to us, their engine decks emitting a haze of oily smoke, and their crewmen opened up the engine grills to allow cooling. The Panther and Tiger engines were of a similar design, a motor unit encased in a solid armoured steel box, with the radiators in separate steel boxes on either side. This was intended to give protection from water if the Panzer had to ford a river because few bridges could take the 48-ton weight of the Panther or the almost 70 tons of the King Tiger. But this protective design caused the motor unit to overheat easily in its steel coffin and engine fires were a common problem. We poured in the last of our oil, then told our accompanying infantry that we would stop for one hour. We took the chance to check our track links and running gear while the infantry sprawled on the forest floor among the leaves and scrub. On the edge of our temporary clearing, some of the men were investigating a parked car, a German Horsch staff car, of the kind used by senior officers. They called us over to see what they had found. In the driver's seat, an SS officer was sitting, staring through the windshield, his head slumped against the door. He had shot himself through the temple, very recently. The pistol was in his hand, and the blood dripping from his head was still wet. Beside him, a woman in civilian clothes, an elegant summer dress and hat, was also dead, her hands clasped demurely in her lap, her eyes shut and a cigarette between her lips. The SS were in terror of the Reds now. After the years of laying waste to Russia, the pits full of bodies, the policy of taking no prisoners, the SS knew that the Reds would show them no mercy. And why should the Reds show mercy after all? The SS had done things during their three years inside Russia which could barely be expressed in words. It was far better for an SS man to die with a bullet through his head and with his pretty mistress beside him than fall into the hands of the vengeful Soviets. There was nothing to be done about these two bodies in the horse car. We siphoned off their petrol tank, which was almost full, and shared it out among the panzers. The shadows were lengthening when we moved off again. The forest held so much life, so much death, and every angle in the track revealed new confusion and suffering. Civilians on foot called out to us endlessly, asking which way they should go 
pleading for the chance to ride on the panzers. Some held their children out to us, showing us how exhausted and ill they were, telling us how far they had trekked on foot, for one hundred or two hundred kilometres from the east. We could do nothing for these people, and at times our gunner had to use a shovel to beat back civilian men who tried to climb onto our hull. As the evening came on, my civilian guide told me that there were three or four kilometres remaining before we reached the central area of the forest. We will have to be careful there, she added. We? I asked her. I assume I can remain with your panzer, she said, as I have been helpful to your unit. How is your arm? Painful. I wish I had morphine to give you. You have none in your medical bag? My arm is very painful now. Why don't you give me morphine, Herr Feldwebel? We have used it all, madam. I do not believe you, she hissed, clutching her arm. I think you are saving it for yourselves. I said nothing, but as the panther rumbled to yet another halt, at a junction of three roadways clogged with carts and even a civilian bus crammed with wounded, I looked at her carefully for the first time. She was perhaps forty years of age, with grey eyes that were burning with indignation. Just a little morphine, she repeated. Please. In front of our panther, an ambulance cart was stuck, its horse collapsing on its forelegs in exhaustion, the wounded troops in the wagon crying out as they were jolted by the people swarming past. I used the last of my panzer crew's morphine two days ago, I said. One of my men was hit by a shell splinter, in the kidneys. It took him three days to die, but we kept him out of pain for as long as we could. When our morphine ran out he begged me to shoot him. She wiped her nose with her hand, evidently chastened. And did you shoot him? Yes, I shot him in the head. I hope someone does that to me if I'm in that condition. But listen, I'll find you some morphine along the road here somewhere. You have been useful. The sounds of battle were loud to the south and east, and it seemed that even in the Kessel the Russians were probing at our forces and wearing us down. Infantrymen ran in from the perimeters, shouting that the Reds were forcing their way into the Kessel in groups of two or three panzers. The trees began to thin slightly, and at intervals it was possible to see the outlines of Soviet aircraft moving over the tree canopy in the blue evening sky. We tore down more foliage to drape over our hulls and turrets, and watched the sky with a desperate urgency before we moved along any stretch of the track that was even slightly exposed. At an exposed clearing among the trees, we encountered a unit of three jagged panzers, low tank destroyers on a Panzer IV chassis, an excellent weapon, and we halted behind them while they scanned the open gap in the treetops for planes. The first Jagd Panzer moved away, surging along the exposed track and beyond it into deeper, thicker forest. The second vehicle paused, revved and did likewise, dashing through the clearing. The final Jagd Panzer took a long time to check the sky, until our troops were calling out to it to move or get off of the path. Its commander ignored the cries, if he could even hear them, and finally gave the command to move. Just as the low, squat vehicle lurched off onto the clearing, the shapes of Sturmoviks tore over us, their shadows filling the roadway. The Jagdpanzer accelerated, committed now to making a break for the denser trees, and made it halfway. Then a volley of rockets smashed down through the trees, splitting the branches apart, and struck the Jagdpanzer directly on its flank. The machine reared up into the air, crashed down on its tracks, and lost control. With smoke pouring from its grills, it veered sideways into the trees beside the road, knocking down several in its momentum and tipping over onto its side. The trees swayed and crashed to the ground, and this only exposed the stretch of road more brutally, giving the red pilots a clearer view of what was down there in the forest. Flames poured from the Jagdpanzer's engine as it came to a stop in a whirl of broken wood, its upper deck facing the break in the tree cover. The people clinging to my panther leaped off and began running into the deeper forest as everybody could see what was about to happen. Civilians, troops and medics all leaped and scrambled away from us, away from the target of the Sturmoviks.
Only the civilian woman stayed, clinging to the turret rear, apparently too fearful to move as I scanned the sky for returning aircraft. I saw none and could hear none, and told my driver to drive like a devil across the clearing. It was a risk, but it was riskier to stay where we were, with the tree cover broken and the Jagd Panzer on fire to mark the target. I dropped down into the turret, and my driver put us in motion with a force that flung me back against the rear wall. Through the periscopes, I saw the trees flashing past, and the burning panzer, with a crewman trying to drag himself out of the hatch, his whole torso on fire. Then the road in front of us lit up with exploding rockets, which ripped up the earth and trees, and sent a barrage of shrapnel over the panzer, the fragments hammering on the hull as we swept over the smoke of the explosion. The panzers behind us did not delay in making their move, and in a minute both our panthers and the two king tigers were across and moving into the comparative safety of the thicker tree cover. After some distance, we paused, and I went up through the cupola to assess the state of the hull. Around us, our troops and civilians were slowly reassembling, having run after us through the trees. On the engine deck of my panther, the civilian woman was lying on her back on the engine grills, her clothes blackened by oil fumes and shredded by the shrapnel from the rockets. Her eyes were open and she was still breathing, but the air was escaping from her chest wounds in long hissing sounds. I lifted her and passed her down to civilians on the ground. The movement caused her a lot of pain and she cried softly with her eyes rolling back in her head. The capo came and stood next to me, his hands on his hips. We have to move on, he said, looking at the woman. The Jarbos, fighter bombers, are everywhere. I promised to find this woman morphine, I said, and we have none left. She's dying. She helped us find the path. She was useful to us. The capo sighed and called for his own panther's medical kit. He took a morphine ampule and injected it into her arm. The woman moaned as it took effect and opened her eyes. Her hands fumbled and she dragged from her pocket a photograph which she thrust at me. I took it, and the woman became still. I guessed that her death was ten or twenty minutes away. At least she was dreaming. I glanced at the photo she had given me. It showed a young woman of eighteen or twenty, the resemblance to the dying woman suggesting that it was her daughter. I frowned, and I put the picture in my tunic pocket, as more aircraft screamed in low above the trees, and the road that we had just passed over erupted in bursts of orange flame. I forgot about the photograph until much later. Further along the track, the primitive road was scarred with craters from recent bombing, and our progress was slowed as we had to manoeuvre past these craters among the other traffic. In many cases, the craters were being bridged crudely with planks and logs, the labour being done by the doomed men that we called Hueys. The Hueys were the Hilfswilliger, the willing helpers. These were Soviet troops who had surrendered to our forces in the good years of 1941 and 1942, when it seemed to everyone that the German steamroller would crush the USSR flat. At the time, these men were faced with prison camps that consisted of great squares of barbed wire. No huts, no tents, no shelter of any kind. No food except the weeds, and no water except the rain. How many had we killed in those encampments, while our guards looked in through the wire as the Reds killed each other and ate the corpses raw? Was it a million, or, as some rumours said, was it actually two million that we starved to death? The Hiwis had volunteered to help the German armies as a way out of that hell, working for us as labourers, drivers, and in other unarmed roles. Their reward was to keep living, to eat a ration every day and have a blanket at night. After Kursk in 1943, the Red soldiers became less prompt to surrender, and those that did were reluctant to work for us. They told us that the penalty for being captured was that their families would be sent to a gulag in the Arctic. Now the Hueys in German territory were caught between two crushing forces. If they stopped helping us, they were of no further value and did not deserve a ration. Their punishment would be a bullet or a noose. Their only consolation was that the Russians did not know they were taken prisoner, and so their families were safe. 
but if they were captured by the Russians now, their identities would eventually be uncovered, and both the Hiwis and their families would face a death sentence. What can a man do in such a situation, faced with such a choice? Some Hiwis killed themselves by whatever means they could find, while others continued to cooperate with our troops, hoping that in this way they could stave off their inevitable destiny. Their faces were set in masks of stress and fear, and their work was the work of condemned men, grim and methodical. We came upon a gang of Hiwis, which was some ten in number, men wearing a ragged mix of Russian and German uniforms and civilian clothing. These men had evidently survived years of their role, and were thin, with hollow eyes and shaved heads. They were hauling a 75 mm PK gun by hand out of a bomb crater as the gun crew simply stood and watched. The gun tractor was in a ditch beside the road, its engine pouring out smoke. As we passed by, other infantry ran past, shouting a warning that the Reds were close. The trees to our left were bulldozed down, and as they fell we saw the green snout of a T-34 pushing through them, barely fifty metres away. I could see another Red Panzer behind it, and a squad of Red infantry too, clambering over the fallen tree trunks to get to us. There were screams from the civilians nearby, as after so many years of being told about the Red Beasts, the beasts themselves suddenly appeared in the flesh. The Hueys, meanwhile, ducked down into the bomb crater, leaving the Paquet gun perched on the edge and the gun crew scrambling for their carbines. As the civilians stampeded away, I went down into the turret, ordered the panther to halt, turn to face the Reds and fire as soon as the gunner was able. It became a race to take the first shot. In panzer duels, the opening shot is often the deciding one if it strikes home. Even if it does not destroy the enemy vehicle, it may damage the tracks or concuss the crew and buy precious seconds for a second shot. The task is to use a combination of the track differential to align the hull to the enemy tank and the turret traverse to lay the shot itself, controlled by the gunner's final hydraulics. An oddity of our panthers was that only the gunner himself could traverse the turret. The commander had no traversing pedals of his own, and for those breathless seconds, while the gunner rotated the great turret left and right with his face against the padded rim of the gun sight, the gunner was the most important man in the machine. The panther turret traversed slowly, but to our advantage we were already stationary, while the T-34 was still labouring over the collapsed trees towards us. Our shot rang out, the tracer flew in its red line, and at that range our 75 mm round punched directly through the T-34's turret below the gun mantle. Through my periscope I saw the red panzer recoil from the impact and the machine crashed into an oak tree, uprooting it. The red infantry spread around the crippled panzer without faltering, and even when the T-34's turret exploded off the hull in a column of flame, then came hurtling down to crush several infantrymen as it hit the ground, even then they kept advancing on us. We fired from the bow machine gun, bringing down many of the Reds, and at the same time my gunner was sighting on the second T-34, which was scrabbling over the wrecked trees in its eagerness to get at us. As its hull rose, we fired at its exposed belly plate, but our shot went wide as the panzer crashed down horizontally again, and we succeeded only in deflecting off the sloped front armour in a cloud of metal particles. My gunner cursed, and my loader worked like a devil to get the next round into the chamber, but as he closed the breech block, that second T-34 opened up on us. I had expected a tracer round, or high explosive intended to tear off our tracks, but what erupted from the T-34's turret was a long straight spurt of burning liquid, an absolute torrent of fire, which spurted through the trees towards us, the splashes catching one of the red infantry as he scrambled to get clear, and setting the man on fire. The man's comrades made no attempt to help him as he burned, but scattered through the trees away from the fire, moving around to our flank. This T-34 was a flampanzer, flamethrower tank, fitted with a fire projector that resembled a normal gun, and its burst of flame caused so much smoke among the trees that it was impossible for a few seconds to see the vehicle itself. 
My gunner muttered to himself, his face pressed against the gun sight, making estimates of where the machine would exit the smoke and traversing a fraction to lay his shot there. I told the loader to have a high explosive round ready next, intending to blow away the flame tube on the enemy panzer. To our right, the Red Infantry was exchanging shots with the PAK gunners and a squad of German troops who had come out from the forest, but of the thousands who must be hiding nearby in the trees, only about fifty came forward ready to defend the Kessel. As I looked back through the periscope at the smoke, the Flampanzer crashed out of the flames and charged towards us, spurting a new line of incendiary liquid that flew wildly around the forest as the Panzer swayed between the trees. The fire shot past us, but I knew that if the liquid hit our rear deck, the flames would immediately pour through the engine grills and blow up our engine in an instant. We in the crew compartment would be reduced to ashes if we could not escape the hull in time. Already I could smell the stench of the Russian incendiary fuel and feel the intense heat from its flames, even through our armour plate. Our round was fired in a hurry and struck the edge of the T-34's turret, glancing off into the trees without penetrating at that oblique angle. The Flampanzer lurched forward, traversing its turret to aim its fire directly at us and elevating its projector tube to make sure that its flames poured down onto us from above. The Red Commander did not get that chance. Our high explosive round exploded on the front of his turret and, as I had hoped, the detonation wrenched off the thin flame projector, sending it spinning off into the trees, trailing a ribbon of flames. Liquid began to gush out from the shattered gun mantle, cascading down onto the front hull. And, as the T-34 began to reverse back into the trees to escape us, we landed another high explosive round in the same place. The effect was immediate. The shrapnel must have set off the panzer's liquid fuel reservoir for its flame gun because the turret hatch blew open and a vertical blast of fire shot up into the air. All of us in the panther crew muttered thanks that this fate was theirs and not ours. What would it be like in the T-34's cramped hull as the entire supply of fuel exploded, sending that tower of flames 30 or 40 metres high? In seconds, the flames collapsed down onto the panzer, and it was enveloped in its own fire, wedged between burning trees and sending spirals of debris out into the forest as it blew itself to pieces. The battle was not over yet. The Red Infantrymen, seeing their panzers destroyed, began to retreat, but kept up a barrage of machine gun fire at our troops as they withdrew. I saw that, passing the bomb crater with the PK gun perched on its lip, the Reds shouted and gestured in triumph as they discovered the gang of Huey men sheltering inside there, unarmed. Our troops began to hold their fire, perhaps conserving their precious ammunition, but also, I suspected as I watched, waiting to see what the Russians would do with their fellow countrymen in the crater. I climbed out onto the rear deck to take a clear look around and saw no more enemy panzers approaching from any direction. The burning Flampanzer was still erupting in orange flames. I saw that the Russians were surrounding the crater, putting grenades down the barrel of the PK gun to disable it, and firing their machine pistols down into the pit. I could just see the bodies of the Hiwis shuddering as they were torn up by the bullets fired by their compatriots. I shouted to one of our infantry on the ground, a young Feldweebel, to fire on the Reds and save the Hiwis. But it was too late. Their task completed, the Red Infantry ran back into the trees towards their own lines, yelling and whooping in Russian.